the Backchat Basketball Show. Hello at backchatpodcast.com.au is where you can email us or backchat underscore basketball uh, is where to find us on Instagram. Give us a follow there. We uh, we put some stuff up from time to time, let you know when our episodes go live. You can send us messages there. People have been doing that, asking us questions ahead of uh, tonight's episode. We are a bit late. And uh, if you do follow us on Instagram, you would have seen that I did tell everyone that we are going to be recording this late after the NBL Grand Final. Because, Ben, if we just did a, a show, you know, three hours ago like we usually would, no one's going to listen to it because it would be out of date very quickly. No, we took a risk here, didn't we? We delayed to make sure that we can get in, watch the NBL Grand Final Game 5, and I dare say we're probably the first podcast in the country to be recording about the game, and we were yes. rewarded, weren't we? What a great game. It's uh, We're talking about it off-air, yeah. that New Zealand will be kicking themselves, but you're right, good executive yep. call from your end to delay, and let's get yeah. into what was an amazing end of the season. It's what I do as the executive here um, on the show. So we have podcasts coming out every Wednesday tonight, bit later you might listen to this on a thursday but that's fine now uh, we talk about nba you talk about nbl tonight we don't really have much to talk about with nba stuff because the nbl grand final was just finished uh, game five the sydney kings are the 2023 uh nbl champions um yeah, the best the team all season one and uh now they get to just keep talking and and rightfully so. They are the best team in the league. Well, what's your initial reaction? You're a uh, not a fan of the Sydney Kings and some of the talk that they have been, uh, what's the right word, propagating into the media over the past couple of months. What's your initial reaction to someone that I think wanted the Kings to lose? How are you feeling right oh, now? No, I didn't. No, no, no. Let's just like make it very clear. I didn't want the, the Kings to lose. I, I All I wanted was a close series, and that's exactly what we got. I, I did say that before. I, I wanted it to go to game five, and then whoever won that, couldn't care because I, you know, no horse in the race. And to be honest, like I, I did used to work at the Perth Wildcats and I've been a Perth guy all my life, Perth Wildcats fan all my life. But now like probably the last two, three seasons, I, I want to say two seasons, but then that just sounds like I'm jumping off the bandwagon because they haven't made the finals. But, but legitimately in the last two seasons or so, as I'm sort of more involved in sports media stuff, I just, it's too hard to be a fan of a team and, and cover that stuff. So I like the Wildcats. You know, I have friends there, so I want them to do well. But um, yeah, so I wasn't like against Sydney to win. I just wanted it close. So isn't it funny I'm how like, like, you, working you, in? You, I was gonna say working in the yeah, space turns us into like anti fans, doesn't it? Like I remember being yeah. in all this fandom, and it just kills it away. And I'm a bit like you. I feel like an old man in the corner with like a basketball flag waving in the air. Like yay, yeah. basketball once night. Go but team. it kind of did. Exactly. Go team NBL, which makes us sound like shields yeah. for the NBL, which is enough of. But again, <laughs> yeah. I did think of you when I saw Paul Smith uh, jumping up and down like a madman on the sidelines. Did you see our friend Paul going nuts after the game? Yeah, very, very happy man sitting next to Andrew Bogert and Luke Longley, uh, the ownership team there at the Sydney Kings. I'm stoked. I mean, it, it, like when, you, when people win stuff and you see the joy, like it's – you're happy for them. Like I don't I – don't, dislike anyone after like just be angry that someone was happy and i did message paul today and um and just said look good luck tonight and enjoy the moment and revel in and then i messaged him before just telling him to revel in it and i know he likes to do a bit of talking so now he can like go i hope he tweets like crazy talks in the media and just goes crazy with it that's some elite level parenting skills there some nice motivational talk the morning of the game and a nice little pep talk after the fact and Again, yep. it sounds a bit corny, doesn't it? But it's it feels rewarding because they were challenged. We were speaking before mm. we started that with seven minutes left, it looked like New Zealand. We're going to pull off a massive upset. Yep. And again, not to sound like Mr. Cliche, but the Kings proved why they're champions, finishing the game Definitely. on that 18-3 run. Cooks, who had an amazing week over the past week getting his NBA contract, was pretty bad yep. in the first half. Yeah. But he wasn't impacting the game. His defense wasn't there and nothing really was going right. But from the midpoint of the second quarter, he turned it on. Mm. He got them back in the game and... Even that said, when he checked out and he had the foul trouble at the end, I thought New Zealand had the game won, but some good finishing moves from Justin Simon. And again, an 18-3 run to win a championship in the last quarter of the season, that is as good as it gets, isn't it? You can't really ask for much more, like you said before, from a basketball fan going to the last minute of the last game. And I think it's probably even good for the sport, taking a bit of a step back and having that meta conversation. You need teams that become super teams that everyone can start to hate collectively. Mm. And you need teams to win to do that. And the Kings are slowly becoming that Golden State Warriors-esque side of the NBL. They're the biggest market. They've got the most money. They've got the best players. I even saw during the week that they're trying to target McDowell White in the offseason to bring him across. Right. And the fact that those rumours are already starting in the moments before and after them win a championship, 
really shows where they are off the court as a team. And again, they've just franked that again with a tremendous game this afternoon. And yeah, winning game five at home like that, good on them for getting that across the line. Yeah, of course. The New Zealand breakers, like really, really awesome work from them. They're a really solid team. Their imports were probably maybe the best import lineup in the league. Um, after the last couple of years of what they've gone through with basically not being in, in their own country for an entire season and quarantining and things like that, for them to be able to come back and do what they did this season is a, a really um, awesome thing to see. And I think that's maybe part of why I, if any part of me wanted one team to win was to see New Zealand win was like a payoff for all of the sacrifice and all of the hustle that they've had in the last little while. And, you know, I, I just think, as I said before, the best team won. New Zealand weren't able to get it done in the same way that I guess the questions were, the question marks around their team were they couldn't score um, when they needed to at times. Um, they were elite defensively, but, you know, on the other end of the court, there was a lot of, like I said, question marks. And we saw that definitely in this game. It was very low scoring um, in the first half. Was it was it 34 to 32 or something? Yeah, they were in, um, the in the 30s. And both teams, yeah. I think Sydney had 11 points in the first quarter. New Zealand had yep. 10 or 11 points in the second term. Yeah, And you're spot on that down the second half especially, Sydney was able to get into the paint, attack the rim. Yep. Xavier Cook's got that going. Justin Simon was able to get to the ring, get to the rim, sorry, and get some easy buckets and get to the free throw line. Whereas you're right, the breakers were hit and miss from three, that when the three balls came, and they came in spurts, there were a couple early, there were a couple to start the fourth quarter, it looked like they were one or two baskets away from really putting that lead out to double figures and making it a match-winning lead. Yep. But again, they couldn't convert enough consistent outside looks and there was just nothing happening inside. And a possession comes to mind, I think there was two minutes left and Brantley was backing down Cooks, who was on four fouls, Got a great look at the rim to make it a three-point game with a couple minutes left, and he just missed a bunny at the rim. Yep. And it was just quite ironic, I thought, that the one time they got inside, they attacked a good matchup, trying to get Cook fed out of the game. They got the look they want, they got inside, and they missed that bunny that, again, you'd make nine times out of ten, and with that, yep. the game effectively ended. And that, in essence, is a microcosm of what we saw from the breakers tonight, that they look good when the shots are going, and McDowell White, who we'll touch on in a minute, had a great game. Yep. But when he wasn't creating, they struggled to find looks. And without that, they weren't able to keep up, which is a pretty crazy thing to say, considering the game finished in the 70s. Yeah. But even then, New Zealand couldn't keep up with what Sydney was able to do attacking the free throw line in the second half. It was very much finals basketball, right? In the NBA, it happens as well. I mean, it's it's changed a little bit um, in the last little while. But when I think of like the peak NBA finals, you know, Celtics, Lakers, Game 7, it's like 68 to 70 and stuff. Like it's a real grind. It's not the best basketball to watch as a, as a casual fan because it's a lot of defense, a lot of fouls. Um, you know, it's it's not, you know, 110 to 105. Everyone's scoring and lots of fast breaks and lots of plays. So it was honestly, it was a, a great game five and it epitomizes, I think, um, the MBO and just the style of play and also what happens in the finals. It gets really dry, like looks like the, the bunny, like you mentioned, are so pivotal. Like if you're not hitting those, it's it's detrimental. So um, I want to talk about Zave Cooks um, just quickly as well after, you know, he did have a pretty rough game um, at the start. So he, um, he ended up with 19 points, 11 rebounds. Awesome. Like two assists. Um, he shot 66% from the, um, from the field. Um, but his work, uh, when he was struggling to get himself into the game, he was rebounding like a monster. Yeah. There was some putbacks. Uh, there was like two or three putbacks where he was like, I'm not, my shots aren't really falling right now. I'm not really getting any looks. And I'm, um, not in his normal style of gameplay. So he just hit the glass so hard. And that was really awesome to watch. I think it's a very good point. I was going through my notes just then, and I made a comment watching the game that he was just grinding out possessions consistent winning possessions and you're right his shot wasn't falling early so it wasn't a case of scoring the ball but he was getting rebounds and getting into his defensive stance and just finding his way into the game that way and then midway through the second quarter that turned slightly because you could see there was a bucket where he finally got inside he was able to get his finger roll going get on the board and started attacking the paint and that was when he got himself going and for that stretch to end the first half in the third quarter cooks was the mvp he was yeah coupling the points with the rebounds with the defensive play whole package was coming together and even again playing the last seven or eight minutes with no room for error with no fouls left to give 
he did that really well. He bodied up, he defended well, and he showed why he's the MVP of the league because it wasn't about the stat line for me. It doesn't even matter what the stats were. It was he was mm. consistently the guy that got the machine going for Sydney. Yeah. And you're right, the game dragged down. I was thinking it many times, especially in the fourth quarter, it reminded me of Cavs Warriors from 2016, Game 7, that was just, yeah. it was a defensive slugfest, both teams, and the reason why it really hit home. Back then, Steph Curry was injured. He wasn't at his best. And there's parallels to Xavier Cooks today that he is still carrying his injury. He's flying off to North America tomorrow to go play in the NBA, yet he's forced to focus on what is the biggest game of his NBA career. And through all of that, the injury, the NBA contract, the fact that this is a massive game and his team needed him, he came through and delivered. And again, is the biggest reason why Sydney won that game. I know Simon uh, at the end there was the one hitting the big shots and Cooks didn't win MVP, but when his team needed him in the second and th- third quarters, he was the one standing up. Yeah. Um, Derek Walton Jr. was excellent. Um, reminded me of um, a bit like a... Uh, 2018 Wildcats beat Melbourne in the grand final series and the MVP was Tariko White um, because Bryce, um, like they they targeted Bryce for, you know, every game and it was a slugfest and, you know, they were double and triple teaming him and it allowed Tariko to get shots up and, and make um, and, and score a lot. And it just sort of reminded me of that because he it was the same boat. It wasn't Zave Cooks, you know, Bryce Cotton being the one who led the team. It was people like that that stand up when it counts and that can score and that can do other things um, to keep their team in it when their star is not struggling. Not there's like there were parts where Zave struggled, but um, it's such a good one-two punch to have with um, with Derek Walton Jr. Yeah, and a big shout out to Angus Glover as well, who looked like he was about to keel over and die to start the fourth quarter. <laughs> yeah. He was hunched over like me and you would after running five k's. I'd love playing a basketball oh, two game. <laughs> Maybe me walking down the stairs after this. Yeah, but he looked like he was about to fall over. But he able to. There was that play where he had the three that pretty much airballed, but he got the rebound and drove yeah. and dunked, and again almost collapsed to the ground. Yeah, thirty seconds later, he hit a three ball. That really, those two possessions, New Zealand was up by seven points, and that broke the run for New Zealand mm. and got Sydney on the board. Gave them really, a sniff. Yeah, and New Zealand didn't score again until the game was out of reach. And again, those pivotal moments, again, taking it back to the NBA flashback. He reminded me of Mike Miller. I don't know if you remember the game when Miami was playing OKC in yeah. the finals. And yeah. Mike Miller looked like he a 47-year-old was, Mike Miller. Yeah, correct. He looked <laughs> like he was a 1,000 years old, hunching up and down the court, hitting threes. Yeah, And that's what Glover did. He got them back in the game, hit that big shot. And again, for New Zealand in that moment, you just have to... Imagine what they were thinking, right? They were so close to breaking Sydney and then there's this guy that looks like he's about to collapse and die. Yeah. He's hitting these big shots just to keep the game close. And again, to what you're talking about before, it just gave Walton Jr. time to get into the stretch run of the game, get back in the game, and then take the game over down the end when the game was ready to be taken over. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I feel like I, I've I watched him pretty close when, uh, when Sydney played the Wildcats particularly. Vasilovic just looked a bit out of it or like all serious. I think that was real, a real ploy from New Zealand to, because he can be let off the leash and, and drop 30 on you. Like he's such a good shooter. Yeah. Um, and, and I think he really struggled. He didn't score tonight. Um, wasn't really much of a factor. Played 20 minutes. Um, but yeah, I think New Zealand obviously had a, a game plan for him because he is a guy who can win your game off his own back. Um, but Sydney had enough weapons. They had enough to do it and uh, just continued to be uh, the best team uh, like they have been all, league, all yeah, season. You're right about Vasilovic. He had a bad series, but tonight was probably the nadir of that. He barely impacted the game and the minutes dried up in the second half. Only had two shots to the end of the third quarter, which is pretty yep. remarkable to think. But again, I think that speaks to what New Zealand's game plan was. And again, for the breakers, a testament of how close they actually were to pulling this off. I know that sounds obvious from looking mm. at the box score and there was a few points in it with a couple of minutes to go. But you're right, Vasilovic is someone that can pop up and in big spurts can take games away. I remember the grand final series against Tazzy last year. He had those spurts. Yes. He was able to pop the yep. chair, pop the cork and be the celebratory three-point shooter as uh, Sydney swept yep. that series. Whereas New Zealand was able to shut him down. And really, they were able defensively to limit Sydney to what was it, seventy six points, yeah, a, a very low number when the game was actually up for grabs. So defensively, there was nothing wrong for New Zealand. They had a, a great game plan. They executed, as you say, they're physical. They were strong. They were into the bodies, and their game plan was sound. And 
that was one thing that they did better than the, the Kings tonight, I thought, that you could tell from the jump that New Zealand was locked in, that defensively yep. their rotations were sharp. Sydney's defence to start the game was poor. We saw McDowell White split a couple of double teams and glide through for easy buckets. We saw him pull up for a three. So the Sydney Kings' defence was very sloppy from the start and, again, a testament to how much talent they have that they could really crank that up and flick the switch and make it happen. Yeah. But there's not much more New Zealand could have done. You had their owner, Matt Walsh, on TV on the game basically saying that if the team keeps the effort up, that he's happy win or lose. Now, I'm sure that losing a game like that, there's some anguish and some annoyment because you were so close. Yeah, you could almost taste it. You could almost taste it, but you can't ask any more of what that team did and there's the cliche stuff about them having the COVID year and the travel, but even just looking at a group of players and a coaching staff that got the most out of their team, I think that's what a coach should be doing, right? Getting the most out of his players. And you can't look at that New Zealand team and say they gave anything short of their best because they were tremendous. And as I say, they were a couple of shots and a few minutes away from stealing a championship against one of the better teams the NBL has seen in the past decade. Yeah, for sure. So what do you think happens now with Sydney? Obviously, Zave is off to the NBA. He he won't be back, hopefully, for a long time. Hopefully, he has a, a really good, significant NBA career and he comes back whenever he wants to, maybe if it's the end of his time at basketball and wants to have another run with the Kings. Um, where do they go from here? Do you think they still are able to sort of be that dominant beast in the league? It's a good question, right? And they're in a very similar spot to where Melbourne United was last year, that Melbourne United obviously lost Landau over to the NBA and their talent got drained a bit more collectively. And I think as well with Sydney, Chase Buford's one to look at because if we're being objective about it, he's got nothing left to accomplish in Australia. He's come down here two years, two championships. Yep. And again, maybe he enjoys the lifestyle to a point where he's willing to stay in Australia, but given that he's got his family pedigree, he's got his experience with the Bucks, and now he's proven that he can run his own team. Similar to what Will Weaver did three years ago when he spent his year with the Kings, I'd imagine NBA teams will be coming in hot after Chase Buford, and if he wants a lead assistant role back in the NBA, that he's probably mm. going to be able to walk into that. So that's the first thing Sydney have to work through is what they're going to do at the head coach. Their success probably works against them. But at the same time, the Will Weaver comment I just made, they got Will through the door four years ago. That worked out well for them. They've got Chase Buford through the door now. So even if he leaves, they've proven that they're a good springboard for NBA-level coaches to come down. Yep. So I'm less concerned about that. On the playing front, you're right. They've got to replace Xavier Cooks. But as I said 20 minutes ago, they have the, the biggest market in the country. And I dare say they're going to be aggressive in going after Australian players. As I said before, there's been the rumours, and I've heard Scott about that they're going to go after McDowell White. And it makes sense, right? He's... Arguably the best point guard in the league now. And if you're human, nothing can happen with New Zealand and a deal can't get reached, why not go to Sydney? So I think it really comes down to how aggressive they can be with getting the Australian import, the Australian players, sorry, to sign up because John really mentioned this a couple of weeks ago and I think there's truth in it that if you can get the best Australian players on your payroll, the salary cap has massive benefits to it and a team like Sydney with their success is going to be able to attract the imports and the coaches. So... I don't think they're going to be sliding down and finishing bottom next year, but whether they can go three in a row is going to depend on, as I say, who's coaching the team and whether they can get the imports through the door to replace what they're going to be losing. That's right. I think part of the, um, so the Wildcats, obviously, you know, they, they win five in seven years or something like that. That was on the back of having a really strong, solid foundation of Australian players. Um, they had obviously good, really good imports as well, but it's not the case of like you just get in the best import and then you're the best team. You need that sort of backbone um, of your squad, of the Australian squad. And when you've got good um, Australian players and you've got a good chemistry with them, um, then that top up piece, all you need is that good import and that can be the difference. So yeah, I I think Sydney almost starts to become this go-to franchise. You know, they've just built this crazy facility. Um, Well, they've, they've they've announced this crazy facility. Um, Obviously, basketball is getting bigger and bigger in the state. Uh, The Kings are really going for it to make themselves, um, you know, they're not going. They're never going to compete with the NRL, but they're going. They're doing whatever they can to make a splash in the in the state. So, yeah, they'll be a destination for sure. Um, And and we've seen already players in the league um, not being re-signed or mutual interest, uh, sorry, mutual contracts not being agreed upon. So uh, the free agency period will be very interesting and obviously we'll, we'll keep covering that. What about um, 
uh, I did hear something about Southeast Melbourne and their link to Trevor Gleeson. Um, I know that was, I think I also heard like, ah, oh, it's not going to happen. But if, if Nick Nurse, and there's a lot of ifs here, but if Nick Nurse is sort of taken out from Toronto, there's some rumblings that maybe they're not super stoked with where the team's at with Nick. If Nick's gone, obviously Trev gets, um, you know, he may get picked up by another team, but chances are that Trev is out of the NBA too. Um, do you think that's a possibility? Do you think Trev makes his way back to, I'm, I'm sure any team would have him. It's a very good comment. I assume, I've always assumed that Trev is going to end up back in the NBL in some capacity. And I hadn't thought about what you just said about Nick Nurse in Toronto because I've heard the same things as you, that if their season doesn't turn around, then just you can tell by the way the media cycle works in the US when there's been some leaks and some scuttlebutt. Yeah. It seems like Nurse is getting set up to be the scapegoat if things yep. don't turn around in Toronto. And if that happens, then the challenge for Gleason's going to be that's not going to be known until late or April now, maybe a team like the Phoenix is willing to wait an extra yeah. six weeks to name a coach, and the fact they haven't already maybe means there is that understanding in place that if things don't work out in Toronto that Gleason could be coming home. But, again, it's also a big change, and I think sometimes we underestimate that. Gleason's obviously got a family. He's got a situation that it's not just him coming back to Perth or Melbourne. He's got a few deeper things to think about than basketball. Even again, maybe he could be a fit for the Sydney Kings now that I'm speaking this out loud, that if, Gee, man. Buford, <laughs> if Buford goes back to the US, then again, seamlessly that works right because you've got uh, the most successful coach of the past decade going to the what is now the biggest team in the NBL needing a new coach. So maybe not even the Phoenix, maybe Sydney would be the landing spot if there is desire for Gleason to come home because if I was him, I'd much rather tag up with our mate Paul Smith than come down to a Phoenix side that's been a bit hit and miss front office-wise over the past five years. Well, there you go. Ben Mallis just breaking news that Trevor Gleeson will be the next head coach of the Sydney Kings. Um, well, uh, message that to Olga, and I'm sure he needs some uh, help and some <laughs> tips breaking some news. <laughs> That's good. Um, so with the Perth Wildcats, there's another question mark there. Um, obviously, there's some players that are you know linked to – there's rumblings that the, the certain players aren't going to be around next year. So names like Mitch Norton perhaps or Todd Blanchfield, they're not – you know signed on the line to be staying at the Wildcats. So there are question marks for them too. And that's that Australian talent that we were just talking about. Um, that would be a really interesting one to see our players. There used to be this lure and this sort of aura about the Perth Wildcats with so much success. And I think the last couple of years have shown maybe they're not, you know, absolutely bulletproof. And, you know, if, if, a, if a, an athlete, uh, sorry, a, a player were, especially maybe it might be more of a veteran player goes, well, I'm not going to, there's no real chance of winning there at the moment. Like they've lost that, that lot, they've lost that shine. So I do wonder how that comes into play when it comes to the recruitment for the Perth Wildcats. Yeah. I think it's less the Wildcats falling back and more the rest of the league elevating around yeah. the Wildcats. Cause again, five years ago, if you were looking to the NBL and you wanted a successful team with a stable front office, with a stable coach, a winning coach and a, platform for the NBA, there were only a couple of franchises in Australia that had all those things ticked. Whereas now the rest of the league is elevating. Obviously yeah, Sydney's more there. Options. Melbourne United's there. For what I just said about the Phoenix, they're there. And also I think we have to be real for any of the Perth fans out there that the Eastern Seaboard is a direct flight back to LA. So someone like Isaac Humphries, for example, was in Melbourne two days ago when he was training in LA. So within yeah. 15 hours they can get back to the US. And again, that's why if I'm a player or an agent, the Sydney Kings and the Melbourne teams are much more attractive than Perth at the moment because there's the proximity to home. There's a bigger market over on the East Coast. And again, there's less flux at the moment. The Wildcats have one off season now where things are a bit more stable. And we've spoken about this before with Greg yeah. that the front office, the coaching staff, the ownership have another go at it now because there's some consistency. But taking a step back the last three years has been pretty volatile off the court for the Wildcats. And you mentioned the roster turnover they're going through. It's pretty clear from the outside that they're trying to turn over the back end of that roster, that the older role players that have been there for a while are probably going to get phased out. But again, that's all well and good. It comes down to what we said before. Can they attract the A-level local talents and get mm. them in the door? Because that's really where it's at. You can try to swing the fences for imports, but they can be hit and miss. But can they really go after a high-level Australian player and get that guy in the door? Respect. Especially as yeah, <laughs> especially as Bryce Cotton ages out right now. He's been yeah. obviously tremendous. There's no way of denying that. But he's an undersized point guard who's getting pushing his 30s 
And the history of the sport tells us those players tend to fade quick. So I don't think we can expect Bryce Cotton to be winning MVPs for the next two or three years. He's probably won his last MVP, to be fair. So that really is the biggest okay. challenge for the Wildcats, is finding a replacement for Bryce. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, without him, this year we spoke about it, they would have been bottom on the ladder and they really rely on someone too much at the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's it's. it's It'd be weird. It's almost weird to think of the NBL without Bryce Cotton. I know we're we're not we're not hinting that that's you know next next couple of years, but it is weird because you know the imports that come through the NBL, they come in for a year or maybe two years and then they're gone again. Like he's been one of the few who have just really stuck around and and you know set his roots in here. Um, so it's just a weird thought to think about the Wildcats thinking a post Bryce Cotton because like. You know, the Wildcats are Bryce Cotton. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a sweet. It sounds bad to Bryce, but he's the sweet spot that makes him the perfect import, right? Because he's mm. not good enough to be in the NBA consistent, so consistently, obviously. But he's got enough shortcomings that means he's not someone that's tempted or tempting NBA teams to call him up every year. Like someone like Xavier Cooks has the profile, the talent, the athleticism, all those cliche things that scout look for. Yeah. Whereas Cotton is just one of many undersized point guards that probably could be a fringe NBA player, but there's not really minutes for him in the NBA. So from the Wildcats, he's, and probably all NBL teams, thinking about it a bit cynically, he is the perfect import because he's good enough to dominate the NBL, but he's not quite good enough to push the NBA. And yeah, it's crazy. He's been in Perth for six years now, which is probably dating both of us. I don't know <laughs> if we knew each other six years ago, but no. it's been crazy to think what he's accomplished with the Wildcats. You weren't even born six years ago. No. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking about as well... Um, uh, Anthony Drimic, uh, who we had on the podcast last week. Do you like my pronunciation of I his? I did. I'm very impressed with that. I can't roll my tongue like that. Yeah, I'm half European, so I can do it. Um, we had him on the podcast last week, and if you're listening to this now, go back and have a listen. It's a really interesting interview hearing about his sort of journey. And he's the second all-time leading scorer at uh, Boise State University, uh, just shy of the all-time leading scorer by two points and said in the interview that he was um, jacking up threes in the last minute of his final game there in the hopes that he would become the all-time leading scorer but couldn't go back and get it done. Um, he has recently, it's just come out that Adelaide 36ers won't be um, re-signing him. He had a, a you know a mutual um, a team and player option for his second year there um, after you know he spent a couple of years in Brisbane after being in Adelaide for uh, four years. So now that he's back in Adelaide and, and they're not going to pick up his option on that second year. So a guy like that is uh, interesting to see where he will, I mean, a, a team will take him. He's, he's, he's solid and he's a good um, a veteran presence to have in your, in your team. So interesting to see where, where he'll end up. So a lot of teams will have, the, the, that's one of the interesting things about the NBL. Um, there's a lot of questions at the end of the at the end of the season. There's a lot of player turnover. You can retool quite easily, but you can also lose a lot of guys. It's so different to the NBA. Yeah, it is. And again, even look at the the breakers. Right, they've there's already been rumours about their team getting gutted due to a mix of salary cut constraints and people wanting to move back to Australia or even their next stars. Uh, I forget the guy's name. It doesn't come to mind right now. He's going to get drafted by the NBA in a couple of months. So that team that we've just been yeah. praising for the past half an hour that came so close to one of the greatest championships of the history of the sport might get gutted over the next month and it's things that are completely out of their control. You mentioned off air about like how to contract work in the NBL and how is that system set up and it's just set up for movement because, mm. again, you've got a transient league where players are trying to push up and get into the league at the bottom end. And then at the top end, you've got players that are trying to explode out. And again, McDowell White, someone that can probably go get a contract in Europe now who wants it. Yeah. It just definitely. depends what does he want for his life. Does he want to live in Australia? Does he want to live in Europe? Or does he want to get onto the G League circuit, which is its own craziness? But there are options now that extend to these players over and above the NBL. Yeah. One more thing um, before we get to a couple of questions that have come through. Um, Melbourne United is an interesting one as well. They've always just seemed to be um, quite a, a dominant team and, and this year obviously they, they missed the playoffs by the narrowest like you couldn't get a narrower margin um, or actually you probably could mathematically but they they just missed out and I wonder is this maybe a, a patch of time in the NBL where they are a mid-tier team at best um, because we've just we're so used to seeing them up the top yeah well I think the the bigger conversation there is that you've got a league where you had this year two teams at the top and two down the bottom and six were mid-tier. So mm. I think it just shows that if you can get like the Kings and the Breakers did, your roster's right and make them click, you can elevate from the pack 
yeah. easily enough because there's not great teams. But at the same time, there is also a pretty fat belly to the league at the moment. That again, the the what we said about the Wildcats applies to United. And then you've got teams like Adelaide and Brisbane who have been yeah. perennially unable to put winners out there. So I do think Melbourne will bounce back pretty quickly. They're an attractive place, as I said, for imports and local players to come back to. But it just shows that if you don't have that one blue chip local player, the history of the league is telling us now it used to be imports, but now it's transitioning to blue chip Australian players that you can really circumvent the salary cap for and get them in the door. That seems to be driving success. Yep. It's what Melbourne needs and Chris Goulding, pretty similar to Bryce Cotton actually, that they're aging out of the players they were through no fault of their own, but time moves on. So United have the same yep. problem the Wildcats have. They need to find that next guy that can elevate their program for the next two years. Without that person, they'll be an average team. But if they can plug someone in over the off-season, then they'll be able to climb up pretty quickly, I think, and be pushing Sydney to reclaim their title. All right. Let's go um, to a couple of questions uh, that were sent in. One was an email at hello at backchatpodcast.com.au and one was an Instagram message. I screenshotted them and I've lost them. Oh, here we go. Uh, let's go to this first one here sent in um, from Brody on Instagram. Uh, are Chase Buford's antics career-limiting moves or the signs of a passionate coach. So obviously in the lead up, and we sort of forgot to talk about this in the lead up to game five, there were comments from both sides. Um, one, uh, Buford sort of uh, talking about the physicality of the breakers and, and how much, um, you know, maybe they'll, they'll play a bit more physical than basketball is used to. And then you had the Sydney, sorry, and then you had the New Zealand breakers uh, CEO, owner talking about, um, the umpire officials, you know, giving more calls to the king. So there's a lot of lot of talk. Um, but let's let's talk about Chase Buford and and obviously he's he stormed out of a press conference after Game Four after he was asked about the physicality. Um, what are your thoughts on, on on Buford? Obviously he's an incredible coach, but what about all that stuff? Yeah, look, it's petulant, isn't it, that he uh, acted like a sport child on Sunday afternoon when he lost his game? To answer the question, it's definitely not a career-limiting move. It, the way I describe it is it's an NBA coach-savvy move that, like it or loathe it, it's uh, a playbook out of the best coaches in the NBA. Steve mm-hmm. Kerr chucks a tantrum every now and again. I remember Chase Buford's dad has run the Spurs in San Antonio for 30 years. And you look at Greg Popovich on the sidelines there, he's prone to chucking a good tantrum, as is Phil Jackson. So, again, these American coaches have just have a different mindset to what we're used to down in Australia. That, as funny as it sounds, storming out of a press conference and berating the officials is seen as a, a strategic move to get the officials to reward you in the next game. So it's confronting. It's not the way that uh, I'm sure you're teaching your children to behave. But in the NBA ecosystem, it's almost encouraged, which can be a strange thing. So, no, I don't think it's going to limit his career in a funny way. No. I think uh, it might actually make some NBA franchises laugh and gain his attention and the, they'll probably assume that there's an issue with the Australian media, which, well, to be fair, there probably is, over blaming Chase Buford for storming out like a sport child. Yeah, well, like you said, I clever move. And Buford's a coach. Coaches are basically chess players with real people on a basketball court. Everything they do, they do for a reason. Some coaches are better than others at doing it, but he's not just having a tantrum and no. leaving thinking, you know, I'm, I'm upset. Like there's, there is, you know, with both coaches, the New Zealand breakers coaches as well said things. Um, they, they're both, they've both been fined this series over comments being made. And again, they're not by accident. They're deliberate. They're trying to get a certain thing over the line and it's very clever. It's what you need to do. Um, it's not a win at all cost thing. I don't think they're trying to cheat, but it's like you need to put everything in place. You can, to win as many games as possible. Yeah, and I think we have to put things in perspective here. You walked out of a press conference. It just made me think, do you see Fred Van Vliet's rant over the weekend? Oh, yeah. yeah. So that is next level. Obviously, calling that happens out in specific referees and calling them F-words and stuff, that's that's another level. That's a, a, how much did he get for that? He got 30, 30K, which yeah. is a drop in the bucket. But the, the thing is, you've spent some time in the US, and again, around any professional athletes, you ask them about officials, there'll be some that they – or MF, mm. constantly behind the scenes. Because, again, like all of us, there are some officials that are just no good at their job or the players loathe. And sometimes that forms its way into the public discourse. And I think for people that are doing what we do, and I'm sure our listeners, it's actually good hearing these coaches speak their mind. And Fred Van Vliet, if he we're hates... saying it at home. <laughs> correct. If he hates an official, say, if uh, Chase Buford is sick of the silly questions that are coming his way from the Australian media, say it. Probably don't stand up and uh, storm out, but... 
again, I think it's better than having some of the football coaches that we know and love that just uh, play that defensive bat shot with every question and don't say anything. I'd much yep. rather have these coaches giving us some personality. Some look beverage about, really yeah. Think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, one more question. Uh, this is from James. Sent it through on email. Um, there is a big question around um, NBL contracts. We're gonna. I'll save this one for Greg because it's a little um, above us, above our pay grade. Um, but he did say this. Another thing: Do players have NBA clauses in their contracts? I.e., Xavier Cooks just signed to the NBA from the NBL. Could his contract have had something in it that meant the Kings and Cooks would mutually part ways in the event of an NBA offer? Uh, thanks, guys. Your loyal Jack Jumper Nuffy, James. Well, it's good to know we've got a Jack Jumper Nuffy out there. I think <laughs> we'd have one of them. Um, to answer your question, yeah, they, they, contracts can have these clauses in them. They're not always the case, but the upper echelon players like Matthew Delavadova had a trigger yep. in his contract last year that allows players to get out of their Australian contract if the NBA comes knocking. I remember I was with Mitch Creek actually a few years ago when he got his deal with the Phoenix to come home, but first line, probably not the contract, but the main premise of the contract was that that is the fallback if the NBA excursion didn't work out. Now for yep. Creek, it didn't work out. He came home and he hasn't had to use the clause. But the savvy players will have those clauses in there and the savvy teams will also put a dollar figure attached to them. So you can see situations where the NBA club has to buy out players from their contract around the world. I, a bit of a tangent, but I read something during the week about Victor Wimbayama in France that his club have a multi-million dollar buyout clause put into his contract. So Brilliant. when he gets drafted, obviously they're going to lose this player that's been propping up their franchise for a year, but he was never going to be there long-term anyway, and they can collect some money on the way. So Xavier Cooks leaving Sydney is a win-win because Sydney get to promote their club, they're going to get paid out, and Cooks is going to get to live his dream. So yeah, yep. the good player agents, and there are only one or two that rule the NBL, will make sure their players have NBA clauses in them so they can get out as needed. Of course, and and definitely with Zave and and the NBA, uh, sorry, and the Sydney Kings, is that the Sydney Kings now literally have a a mole at the NBA. Like anytime Zave hears of a guy like maybe on the outer and is like, oh, what's it like playing in Australia? He'd be like, mate, go play for the Kings. They look after you, you know, champ. They're champions. Like they've got a a walking advertisement for any players that are on the fringe of of. Um, being in the league that potentially looking for a sea change and want to come to Australia, they've got a guy that's just going to feed them. He's not going to go, oh, yeah, go to the NBL and play anywhere you want. Like, he's just going to promote the Kings. It's very, it's a very good deal for the Sydney Kings. It is. And even just I'm scrolling through Twitter here, because Xavier Cook's agent is Daniel Moldonovan, who, yes. from looking at a photo on Twitter, represents seven players on the Kings. So half of the Kings roster is warehoused by one player agency, and Moldonovan's agency is part of Octagon now, which our listeners probably don't know this, but that's the global brand that represents Steph Curry, Bam Adebayo, and a whole suite of NBA level all stars and superstars. And obviously, they're not going to be coming down to the NBL. But you're right about Sydney is spot on that they've elevated the athlete over to the US from Sydney, and you've got the player agent side who lives in California that's going to funnel players back to teams like the Kings. Yeah, and it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy now that they can start winning, and they're in Sydney. They've got the money: Paul Smith, Andrew Bogut, Luke Longley it can become a procession line very easily and they're very quickly and I think they have already become the number one destination for players wanting to come down to the NBL and springboard the league to get out of Australia and back to the NBA. For sure. There you go. Well, next week on the basketball show, we have a guest all the way from Dallas, uh, a mate of mine, Tim Cato, writes for The Athletic. Um, he's a, a writer there that is you know, he's not just a writer that sits at home and watches games and writes about it. He literally flies around with, follows the Dallas Mavericks around, gets flown to different games. He, he did a deep dive in um, Slovenia after Luka Doncic was uh, was drafted and, and did a big story there. So he's a legit, like he's a, a legit NBA reporter. So I'm looking forward to um, speaking to him. I, I've been chatting to him a fair bit over the last uh well, the last couple of years, but in the last few weeks, texting back and forth a lot. And he said he's going to give us um, an NBA exclusive that no one else knows. He said he's going to save one up for us and, and bring it out on the Back Chat Basketball Show. So I'm I'm looking forward to that. Maybe it's um, something around, uh, well, look, the Mavs have a lot going on at the moment. So we'll see what that is. Maybe he's uh, got a secret video of Corey Irving's new Sage flavor or something. Because he's a, a capital J <laughs> journalist and yeah, it's going to be good next week. I think I'm going to be needed there for the counselling session as uh, you, the Mavericks fan, talks to Tim, the Mavericks reporter. It's uh, yeah. 
Yeah, we'll that's right. Next week, hopefully your Mavs can get Luca back and start winning some games because it's not looking too flash hot at the moment. For sure, that's all right. Get us in the play-in. We'll be champions, no problem at all. Congratulations to the Sydney Kings, uh, the most deserving team to win this year. They were the most dominant, the best team, um, had the best player in the league, uh, brilliant coach, and um, look, we'll see what happens next year in the NBL. We're going to continue to talk about the NBL because now all the fun stuff happens, draft, uh, sorry, not draft, all the, the trades and player signings, who goes where, who isn't returning to clubs. Um, so we'll be following that and doing lots of – now that the – now that the league's finished, um, we've got a list of guys that are going to come on to the show um, to to chat. Now that they've got a bit more extra time, uh, a lot of uh, players from all across the, the country. So really looking forward to getting into some of that. And, of course, we'll chat NBA. Um, at some point, we'll, we'll call it end of the season and we'll have a break. But we're going to keep powering through. Uh, back chat underscore basketball on Instagram. Give us a follow there. And, uh, Ben, I'll chat to you next time. We'll see you next week.